Okay, I think we're ready to start. Uh, it's really very, very nice to see so many of you attending tonight. So uh, I'm Peter Maravellis, and on behalf of City Lights Booksellers, I'd like to welcome you to City Lights Live, the virtual reading series that continues in the footsteps of our in-store calendar during the shelter in place. We continue to celebrate the works of authors we know and love with readings, discussions, forums, and more throughout the month of August and into the fall. We are happy to say that City Lights has finally reopened its doors to the public. Of course, following San Francisco Health Department guidelines, we aim to make our reopening as safe as possible for all of you and our workers. So please do come and visit us. You'll be once again able to browse our stacks. Our business hours are seven days a week from 12 noon to 8 p.m. We have worked very hard to transform the store. The entrance is now on the Broadway side of the building, which is uh, 271 Columbus. The original entrance is now an exit only. So. We encourage everyone, please do wear a mask while visiting. Uh, we're trying to keep things safe for everybody. So as many of you know, City Lights is a publishing house as well as a bookstore. We continue to publish in the grand tradition of Lawrence Ferlinghetti's uh, seminal Pocket Poet series, publishing everything from poetry through to literature and translation um, and nonfiction books informed by a very progressive political outlook. We recently published a new book for James Tracy and Hillary Moore called No Fascist USA, the John Brown Anti-Klan Committee and Lessons for Today's Movements. Uh, we also published a book by Stan Cox called the, new, the Green New Deal and Beyond, Ending the Climate Emergency While We Still Can. And there are many more titles coming up. We've got uh, in the fall books from Todd Miller, Tim Weiss, Juan Philippe Herrera, and many others. So to learn more about the books that we publish, as well as stuff that's coming through the store and our upcoming events, please visit us at www.citylights.com. And you can also keep up on our activities via uh, social media. We have a presence on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. So uh, we are really delighted to have Cynthia Kaufman here with us. She is no stranger to City Lights, having you know appeared at the store in the past. We greatly respect her work in the community as, as an organizer, an activist, and also an educator. We're really happy to be celebrating the release of her new book, Challenging Power, Democracy, and Accountability in a Fractured World. It is published by Bloomsbury Books. And as we're poised on this precipice, both politically, culturally, ecologically, I think challenging power really arrives in a very timely fashion to kind of reframe old discussions surrounding the quest for justice and, and also offer us a kind of a, a compass to kind of drive social change. So um, Cynthia Kaufman is a lifelong activist and director of the Vasconcelos Institute for Democracy in Action at De Anza College, where she also teaches philosophy. She is the author of two books on social change, Getting Past Capitalism, History, Vision, and Hope, and Ideas for Action, Relevant Theory for Radical Change. Um, as I said, she's a lifelong activist for social change and has worked on issues such as tenants' rights, police abuse, union organizing, international politics, and most recently, climate change. So joining her in conversation tonight is uh, Francesca Capras. She teaches English and Asian American studies at De Anza College, and she is the faculty coordinator of the Jean Miller Resource Room for Women, Gender, and Sexuality. Uh, she is also the 2020 and to 21 Fulbright Scholar to the Philippines, where she will be researching uh, discourses on digital literacy. Her interests and community work include international human rights, uh, intersectional feminism, digital culture, and decolonization. So the way this evening's event is going to proceed, we'll have a discussion. It'll be followed by a Q&A. Uh, I encourage you, please post your questions via the chat function that's activated by the uh, button at the bottom of your screen. I will collect the questions at the end and then read them out. Uh, so you may also purchase books of um, or copies of Challenging Power via the link that's going to be posted in the chat function. Uh, so please do purchase a book. I mean, it really does help City Lights out. Uh, we're not really out of the woods with COVID right now. And as with most under other indie bookstores, uh, we're struggling to make ends meet. So buying a book really makes a difference in helping us continue with our mission. So we're grateful for your support. So Cynthia Kaufman, Francesca Caparas, and everyone, welcome to City Lights Live. Thank you. Thank you. And Peter, did you just want to make your comment about the gallery view thing? Oh yes, thank you. Thank you for remembering. So if you um, go up to the upper right hand corner of your screen, there's a little square box. And if you click on it, it says speaker view or it says gallery view. You wanna click speaker view because then you'll get one person at a time. So there you go. Thank you. That's nice. Yeah. Thanks. 
thanks everybody for being here. Um, so uh, really excited to have this conversation with you, Cynthia, about your new book. And thank you for writing it. I think it's definitely needed um, at this time. Um, so just to get us started off, I was thinking uh, particularly about the subtitle of your book, which is Democracy and Accountability in a Fractured World. And it makes me want to ask, like, what moved you to write this book? What was happening globally that you were responding to? You know, what made the world fractured to you? And in what ways is it even more relevant now? Okay, thanks. Yeah. Well, so uh, I'm a person who has, for my whole adult life, been just paying attention to the traumas of the world. And, um, and when I think about the fractured world, I think about... Um, uh, you know, I have four examples in the book of, of sort of different traumas. There's police abuse, climate change, um, the, the um, international uh, economic crisis, and, um, and then and the, um, and the, the collapse of Rana Plaza in Bangladesh in 2013. And it was around the time of that disaster that I started thinking about how um, how our concepts of democracy and our concepts of ethics and who's responsible for what and how do you stop these traumas. And I started realizing that, that some of the theoretical tools we have for dealing with that were just not quite strong enough. Mm -hmm. Yeah, awesome, thank you. Um, yeah, and I guess uh, also if you could just, I guess, describe what accountability democracy means, uh, maybe how you define the concept of accountability, because I think you make some really great distinctions between other ways of framing like, um, things like liability or punishment. So, yeah. yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Well, so the, um, you know, I kind of start from this idea that people around the world are really losing faith in democracy. Um, mm -hmm. And the idea is that governments that like call themselves democracy are not able to meet people's needs. So why is that happening? And one of the things that I argue in the book is that there are forms of power that are wrecking havoc on our lives that, um, that, that sort of traditional representative democracy is not really up um, it's just not strong enough for. So then what I do is I sort of talk about politics, broaden the idea of democracy from just meaning either participatory democracy or representative democracy to being about how do we hold power to account? And the idea is that there are all kinds of unruly forms of power in the world that are destroying all kinds of things. How do those forms of power operate? And what are the ways we can hold those forms of power to account? And then to say we have democracy when people have power over their lives and they have power over their lives when they're able to sort of manage and hold to account those systems of power. And as you said too, then there's a whole sort of, there's a whole chapter on ethics and the idea is that I think most Western ethics is created in this very narrow frame to say I'm responsible for sort of intentional acts that I do as somebody else mm -hmm. kind of close in space and time. And the idea that no, we're, res we're responsible in much bigger ways. And so the idea of like, you hold people to account when they're able to make a difference to challenge a system of power. And that's, mm -hmm. and so, so that accountability isn't, like you said, it's not just about liability. It's not just about, you know, what can you throw somebody in jail for? But like to take the example of the, the collapse of Rana Plaza in Bangladesh, am I responsible for that because I bought a cheap shirt that was made in Bangladesh? Mm -hmm. Is the Bangladeshi government responsible for that? Are the markets responsible for that? Who's responsible for markets? So a big part of the book is really answering those questions about responsibility and how we, and what are the actual practical ways we can, we can tame those, those um, wild forms of power. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Thank you. And I think that's really important, especially now, because you use the word wild. And for those of us who are in California, you know, we're currently dealing with these um, wildfires on top of other climate disasters, right? And so I think, it, you know, there's these larger questions of who's responsible, right? Mm -hmm. For You know, especially because it's not as clear as like PG&E did it, right? But it's like lightning and nature and all these storms that are happening. So, um, yeah, I mean, I guess, you know, if we could apply accountability democracy to the example of wildfires, uh, right now, how, how could we, whom should be held accountable? And I know it's not just necessary, I don't say whom and that it's an individual because I yeah. think you make a good claim that it's, it's a system, right? Yeah. 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 And so then what a, a big part of the book is the idea of, of um, that you have account that accountability democracy is the big concept. And then the smaller concept is accountability mechanisms. And so the idea is that 
I look at like, what does accountability even mean? It's like you're holding somebody responsible and you're trying to figure out a way to keep a problem from keep happening. So if you, and so that, and one of the things I argue is that accountability mechanisms have five parts. There's somebody says, says that there's a problem. That problem is considered a serious ethical uh, issue that needs to be dealt with. Somebody is held responsible. You come up with some kind of a sanction and then you have enough power to make that sanction stick. So that that's the kind of, and so, and so if you think strategically about what are the things to stop a problem. So let's just take the wildfires. You know, there's a whole bunch of different accountability mechanisms. And, you know, I mean, the most fundamental one, of course, is about climate change, right? You know, California has always had fires, but the, the level that they're at right now is, is about climate change. So then who do we hold responsible for climate change? And what I would say is that we're all responsible to the extent that we can figure out ways to, to shift the systems that are causing the problem. Mm -hmm. And so that means, and so I wanna take that with climate change, you wanna take that from the individual, from the idea of like, oh, if I just reduce my own personal carbon footprint, a concept, by the way, that was created by British Petroleum. So I just think it's important to, there's so many things that people do to try to make things into sort of individual lifestyle problems as opposed to big social systemic problems. Mm -hmm. So, you know, with, with climate change, I think one of the most important things is getting the fossil fuel industry out of our decision-making processes. So me and a bunch of people who are on this call are involved with trying to get our pension systems to divest from fossil fuels. And the idea is let's, make it such that the let's figure out the ways that we as individuals can work to make it such that the fossil fuel companies don't have as much power and so that's a kind of a, a, a again it's sort of an, a, a, an accountability mix and to make it so that somebody is responsible for climate change who's actually going to make a difference which will actually mm -hmm. have no consequences yeah i really like how you frame that in the book that responsibility the amount of responsibility is kind of relative to the amount of power you have over a situation right so yes we as individuals you know we can choose to not use fossil fuels you know buy organic um reduce our carbon footprint but in terms of like who has the large scale power to actually create the most change th those are the folks or the sort of groups who are the most responsible yeah so thank you um i i also wanted to um ask kind of a question about sustainability, right? Because I think that, you know, for those of us who are in, you know, organizers work in social movements, there's a lot of burnout. Um, how do we keep a movement sustainable? Um, and uh, I want to talk specifically or, you know, about your example with Eric Garner. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, you lay out how it's symptomatic of the dehumanization of Black folks and how we need to take control of systems of meaning that dehumanize certain groups of people, which I think is exactly right. Um, and uh, there's a lot happening uh, in terms of uh, awareness being raised about police violence, racialized police violence. Um, but there's also a lot of criticism that even though we, there's this shift in like, we know we need to value black lives, like, is it a trend, right? Or how do we keep those movements sustainable um, so that it, it, they continue to last, you know, in terms of how, who do we hold accountable so that it is a more sustainable movement. Yeah. yeah. Wow. All right, that was a lot. <laughs> there was a that lot was a lot. I think I want to step. I, th I want to step back, and there's a couple of things about about accountability in the situation. I just want to. I want to say, you know. I, um, so when I talk about the accountability mechanisms, you know, I talk about like if you look at the example of of police violence, that there's the sort of something has really shifted because the voice, right, that that people now are seeing because people are taking the pictures you know, the videos of these, these um, horrific murders, you're able to, to know about it. But what's been weak in police accountability around the murder of black people has been, like you said, the values piece, which is that mm -hmm. if those lives aren't valued, you can say, look, somebody was murdered by the police and nothing really happens because the juries don't take it seriously. The, the, the legal system doesn't take their, the, uh, the rights of black people seriously. So that the missing piece in the accountability mechanism around the around police violence really is the values piece. It's that dehumanization piece. And mm -hmm. I think that that's really important. And that's why I think Black Lives Matter has been so huge. Just saying that really strongly and therefore rights in the legal system and, and, you know, and, and respect for law have to apply in this case where they don't. You know, when you think about what happened in Kenosha about, um, and I'm mm -hmm. sorry, I'm blanking his name. Uh, Jacob Blake. Yeah. Jacob Blake's murder, and then the, the white guy who walked through murdering people and the police just let him keep walking on by. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just 
a horrendous case where you can see the that that system of meaning. So, so what keeps it going, Chessa? I mean, I feel like the um, you know, I'm a big believer in Gramsci and, you know, his idea of hegemony, which is that, mm -hmm. which is that when a lot of people make a lot of noise and think about things in different, different ways, systems of meaning can shift in ways that there can, becomes like a new common sense and kind of a new normal. Mm -hmm. So I think we're in the middle of a revolution where we're starting to come up with a new normal about the humanity of Black people. And I think that that's really important. And so I feel like what's going to make all of that stick is that sense of Black people's humanity mattering. And if Black people's humanity matters, then of course the police officers have to go to jail. And of course you can't have armed, you know, police walking like thugs through our communities. And that, and and so the rest of it almost follows naturally once that mm -hmm. first part happens. Mm -hmm. So I just think we just need, I mean, I think tremendous deep systemic changes are happening right now. And I don't think we're running out of steam because unfortunately new murders keep happening every day. And so every day that a new murder happens, we're, we're re-brought back to that sense of, um, of the importance and the urgency. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I'm also curious, you know, thinking of how these things are brought to our attention, usually through social media, right? Um, how, as we use these platforms to exercise our voice, how do we ensure that it doesn't lead to another accumulation of power, especially because most of these platforms are owned by private companies, right? And I think you talk a lot about, we really have to you know, accountability democracy is about keeping the accumulation of power in check. And, you know, one of the concerns is that, you know, Instagram, uh, Facebook, uh, Twitter, even Zoom, right, are, you know, accumulating a lot more power, especially during this pandemic, because we're trying to stay connected. So how do we, um, how do we make sure, how do we hold those corporations to account, especially because, you know, they engage in a lot of really shady business practices. <laughs> yeah, and you know, Chess, it's like, those business practices are so shady that it's actually not even that hard of a question. You know what I mean? It's just like, you just put Elizabeth Warren in charge and everything's going to be fine. I mean, I just, in other words, like, it's, it's some very basic stuff about breaking up monopolies, right? I mean, it's just some very, very basic stuff in that case, you know, of, um, you know, you think about when, um, when Facebook was allowed to buy Instagram. I mean, that's insane, right? Because, I mean, I personally hate Facebook. I find it really unpleasant. And I think, you know, if there had been some other options for some other platforms, then a bunch of us would have moved to some other platforms. But if they keep buying up the new platforms and making them into their same hellacious commercial machine, then, right. you know, then there's no escape from that. But, you know, if you have really strong, uh, and so that's where I, th I actually think government regulation is really important, you know, like just break up the monopolies and you're done, you know, have some basic rules about data privacy and you're done. Yeah, I think also it requires, because I feel like the discourse is also shifting or the rhetoric, right? Because you talk a lot about how there's, you know, previously there's this rhetoric of the market's responsible. It's not our fault that, you know, this factory collapsed. And I feel like with things like Facebook and Google and everything, the, the new rhetoric is that the algorithm is responsible, right? Oh, yeah. I didn't, you know, feed you this content. It's just what you, what other people like you liked. So how do we challenge that narrative? Yeah, well, and also because it turns out that the algorithms are all racist, right? I mean, that's mm -hmm. just like one of the, there, I, I was on a call with some uh, people in Britain the other day and they were talking about, you know, because kids aren't able to get through school now, or, so the universities have algorithms. And so guess what? All these rich white kids are ending up like, you know, getting A's for the semester, even though they're not in school and going to Cambridge. Whereas like, you know, working class kids are, you know, anyhow, right? It's like, you know, garbage in, garbage out. And so, so many of those algorithms are deeply racist. And so, yeah, you have to hold those algorithms responsible, right? Mm -hmm. and, and it seems to me that, um, that the companies that own them, you know, just, so one of the things I talk about a lot in the book, one of my four examples is the way markets come to be seen in a capitalist society as if they're normal and natural. Of course, they're not. They're created by, you know, thousands of human decisions that take place over time, which means that people can make different decisions and make markets be mm. different. I would say the same thing about algorithms, right? That you've got to dig in deeply to who's programming those algorithms, how are they functioning, and what kinds of disasters are they creating, and to make the people who own them and control them to say that they're responsible for them. And then, and then, you know, part of the accountability mechanism thing is not just to say they're the bad guy. It's like, okay, then what are we gonna do to make it so that they have to stop, 
right? And that's where the organizing piece comes in. What do we need to do to cr make voices strong enough um, such that the regulators who could pass laws to make those algorithms not be so racist actually are able to, to make that change happen? Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah, and especially because, you know, you and I, we work in the Silicon Valley, so we, we're familiar with a lot of this, uh, this social movements against tech companies. And I feel like there is a, a big push to even making those algorithms transparent. Right? Yeah. Because I mean, right now they're all proprietary because they're not going to release, you know, how Google gets you your search results and, you know, but they are racist, sexist and, you know, cis normative. So yeah, I think that's really yeah. important. Yeah, yeah. Breaking up the, um, breaking up the monopolies, but also more transparency in how they're actually run. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. So I also, because uh, you also talk about organizing and, you know, once the information is available to us, we need to, you know, create these movements around them. And so I kind of want to talk to you as just like a colleague now, because you and I both met in our work as educators. Um, and I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit about the role of education in accountability democracy. And I don't mean just like formal education, you know, like in, um, uh, in schools, but just education in general, like especially how do we educate people about the relationship between power and systems of meaning? Um, how do we educate people to organize? You know? Yeah. And I know you've been doing some of this, or a lot of this already. Oh, you mean the education around organizing? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know, I just think we have to tell the truth, right? I mean, I think that so, so, much, of, so much of what's wrong, I mean, so, right, so much of school is propaganda, right? You know, mm -hmm. teaching people, you know, that democracy is just about government, teaching people, you know, the sort of the propagandistic views of history that we get, the dehumanization of people of color that you get in education. Um, mm -hmm. The idea that we're all spectators, the idea that social movements don't matter and make a difference, right? I mean, so much of what people learn in school is so incredibly counterproductive, right? And so, mm -hmm. um, you know, and again, I kind of go back to Gramsci, you know, um, uh, on that, the idea that, um, that, you know, there's a, there's a, you know, people are starting to talk now more about decolonizing the curriculum. And I think that's a really mm -hmm. serious, important idea that we need, we need to, to change what we're teaching. So, I mean, you think about this, right? Like the world's on fire, right? We have, you know, 10 years to really make humongous changes to, to deal with the climate crisis, or we're completely doomed as a species. That's some serious, urgent stuff. And the idea that in school, it's like, oh, let's teach about this and that and the next thing, you know, it's like, you know, so I guess I feel like with, with respect to education, that we need to teach people the reality of the disaster that we're in. We need to teach them about how power actually operates. And we need to teach them also, and this is again about the work that you and I both do, is about um, the, um, the ability that they have to make a difference, right? You know, it's, it, it's when people are mobilized and demanding change, the change happens. And so I do feel like um, we need to give them those skills. Mm -hmm. And what do you feel would be like the best mechanisms for giving them those skills, especially if, you know, formal education has been about, you know, kind of brainwashing and propaganda. Yeah. Um, well, you know, I think both you and I do this at work, right? I mean, I, so mm -hmm. I run a community organizer training program. And so, you know, they learn that through classes that are about sort of, you know, the nature of the disasters we face, the nature of the, the changes that people try to make that are effective, and then the kinds of skills, and then they learn through practice, right? They have an internship where they actually do that work. So, mm -hmm. um, I mean, I think you and I have both seen that our students can come to us completely beaten down and silenced by, mm -hmm. you know, all the terrible education that they've gotten. And, you know, you start to treat them with respect and care and you start to say like, no, your opinion actually matters. And they just blossom really quickly. And then they become, you know, revolutionaries and they go out there and they do it. And, you know, they're out in the world doing crazy things. And it doesn't take much, right? I mean, a, a little bit of, a little bit of respect and care and love and, and, and encouragement. And um, yeah, I feel like we see it every day, right? Yeah, and it's amazing how, <laughs> how little like just seeing somebody as a human being in their humanity is a revolutionary act nowadays because i don't think that that we're doing enough of that yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. i mean don't you find that in my uh, teaching yeah oh yeah definitely definitely and also yeah. with your with your work with your interns at the center too mm -hmm. right you know, yes. just a little bit of you know, you feed them a little more responsibility at a time, you give them sort of, mm -hmm. you respect their humanity, you give them a couple right. skills here and there, and all of a sudden they're just doing unbelievable yeah. stuff. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Knowing that they always have potential, that they have power with, I think for me, what really helps is acknowledging the power that they have within themselves. Yeah. Right. It's not that I am this teacher or this boss that is going to bestow power upon them, but saying like, Hey, you actually already have power. Let's tap into that. And, yeah. You know, yeah. Can we talk about that for a second, Chess? I think you were yeah. maybe going to get to that later, but one of the one of the big themes in the book is about about power and the nature of power, and mm -hmm. and you know, and what you just said is like that's a positive view of power, and it's one of the things that I think is really important is that um, I think so often people who believe in social justice think that power is a bad thing, you know, and mm -hmm. that they, and that like we're against power. And as I was researching this book, I was you know I've read a bunch of Foucault and all kinds of like you know really fancy theorists on power. <laughs> And actually my favorite definition of power came from Martin Luther King. And it was basically power is the ability to achieve, the ability to achieve purpose, which means that power is neither good nor bad. It's, and that when people have a lot of power, they're able to reconfigure the social world to meet their interests. So power out of control becomes a terrible thing, but we actually mm -hmm. wanna have power, right? And we wanna mm -hmm. use power for good things. And so, right, and so our students all have, they have tremendous power that they often don't know about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think, you know, connecting to other parts of your book, like power aligned with values, right? Yeah. Like if we, if we know that we're working towards shared values, then we have, you know, we have the power to create the world that we want to live in. Um, and so thank you for, for bringing us there. Because I'm also curious, like, how do we work towards a shared vision and use our collective power if we don't have shared values? Right. Um, because I feel like that, especially, you know, just reading the news nowadays, you know, there's such a divisive culture. So w what are the ways that we can, it's a mix of seeing people in their full humanity, but also trying to align our value, our shared values. You know? Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's funny. I, I went to grad school when the whole postmodern thing was really, you know, emerging and it was like, oh, that's like humanism is this like, you know, bankrupt, enlightened, backwards, blah, blah, blah. And I just like, I don't know. I've, I've just gotten really into the idea of, of values and that it's actually pretty simple, right? It's sort of like, you know, care and compassion for other human beings and for the, and for the rest of uh, the living world, you know? And if you kind of just start with that, you get pretty far and it's actually not all that complicated. And I do think, and I think sort of compassion and empathy and just some of those really basic values get you pretty darn far. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And, and, and you know what I find too is that, um, is that uh, even with people with different political perspectives, that if you kind of keep digging into that sense of kind of common shared humanity and kind of, connection to the rest of, of the living world. Um, it's not that hard to get to a place, right? That, that, that you don't need to get super complicated about what those, mm -hmm. those core values are. And I know, you know, as a person with a PhD in philosophy, I'm sort of not supposed to say that because, <laughs> you know, right? Because it's supposed to be way more complicated than that, but I actually don't think it is. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm, I'm really glad you brought it there because I definitely, I went to grad school and when you know, I, I didn't even know if my words had any meaning because I was so entrenched in postmodern like theory, you know, right. so it was like really hard to write a thesis, not knowing if words actually mean what you think they mean. So yes, definitely yeah. share humanity. Um, and, and, and the idea of like not doing harm or doing our best to not cause harm. And when we do harm to hold ourselves accountable or hold yeah. those who have done harm, uh, hold them accountable. And actually, let me just go a little step further on that, because that's one of those things, you know, at first I was, just, I was sort of joking that like, that's not very like, you know, professional philosophy or whatever, but actually, <laughs> actually it is because I, I have a whole bunch of stuff that I did a while ago on this. And it's sort of like, it's like, if there are no universal truths, then the truths are just what we make of them, right? And so then like, what are the truths that are going to be useful? Well, I'm going to make the case that like sort of compassion, care, and empathy is really fundamental. And like, give me some, like, tell me why that's wrong. And let's talk about it. And it's in our discussion, in our dialogue that we come up with truths, like, you know, that there are no more fundamental. So in some ways, that's the postmodernist in me saying that, like, that's all we got. So, so tell me why I'm wrong, you know, and let's talk about it. Like, tell me why an apocalyptic world where, you know, fossil fuel companies and racist cops get to destroy everything. Like, tell me why that's better, you know. I bet you can. <laughs> No, I think that's great. It's, isn't there like some YouTube channel of this guy who sits at a table and just says, 
prove me wrong and then oh, oh, no, no, weird things. anyway it yeah. sounds like it'd be really annoying to watch but um yeah. <laughs> but I, I like that I like the idea of like I believe in in care for you know fellow human and tell me why that would be a bad thing you yeah because I think that's that is kind of um kind of where we've ended up is this like kind of intense relativism where folks don't they say like well this is my truth and this doesn't hurt me so therefore I don't care if it hurts you or it doesn't matter that it hurts you yeah uh, yeah. yeah, but we are fundamentally connected, right? We are fundamentally mm -hmm. connected to each other, like in the air that we breathe and the diseases mm -hmm. that spread. And, you know, you maybe don't care about poor people and undocumented immigrants, but guess what? Like, you're going to get COVID from them, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, and the same thing with, you know, with the rest of nature. It's like, if you're going to have a really, you know, sort of constrained moral universe that's only about human beings, well, guess what? Human beings can't survive without being in a, in a healthy dynamic relationship, right? Mm -hmm. We are fundamentally all connected. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Um, so I also wanted to kind of talk about because I know it's getting close to November. Um, time is time is feeling very weird these days, but you know it is coming. Um, and there's one section of the book where you say that one of the features of an accountable government is that it should engage the people so that they feel their decisions matter. And I feel like when you're asking that question, like I I care about compassion for all living things, prove me wrong. Like that's engaging and you're inviting people into yeah. a conversation. And so, um, you know, for a government to engage people so that they feel their decisions matter, I'm wondering, do you feel like that is happening as we move towards the 2020 election? Uh -huh. You know, do you think people feel like their decisions matter, that feel like their opinions, their values matter in you know, why or why not? Wow. Uh, I don't know why, Shessa, but that actually hit me like a, as a kind of a heartbreaking question. And you know why? Because it's like, I'm going to vote for Joe Biden. Everybody should vote for Joe Biden. But boy, do I feel like the, the, um, that sense of like engagement, inclusion, you all matter. We've been listening to you. Everybody's on fire about Black Lives Matter and the climate and, you know, and so on and so forth. It's like, I'm not feeling much resonance with that in the national conversation. And I find that really heartbreaking. I feel like, you know, Sanders and Warren just like raise so much of that, so much of like, there's a dialogue about things that actually matter. Like, let's talk about like poor people in rural America and why their lives are terrible. You know, let's talk about those issues. And it was really happening sort of during the primaries. And then now it's like, bam, at least to me, it feels like that conversation is dead. It's done, mm -hmm. it's over, and now it's just pure functional. Let's make sure the fascists don't win. Mm -hmm. So, you know, yeah. but whatever. I mean, that's where we are. <laughs> <laughs> but whatever, that's where we are. That's the bumper sticker right there. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, and I, I, well, it's interesting. I, I also wanted to ask, you know, I'm an English teacher, so I, I really like hone in on word choice. And you say, they feel their decisions matter. And the choice of the word feel to me was really important because I'm curious, like, do you think it's enough to feel that your decisions matter as opposed to them actually mattering? Do you know what I mean? Like, oh. and also because I feel like a lot of the younger generation have this apathy, you know, this lack of feeling like their decisions matter. So is feeling kind of the, the what we should focus yeah. on? Yeah. Yeah. It's funny, Chesa, because at first when you asked the question, I, I was like, when you refer to our students, I, there is a way that I think the affective domain really matters in politics, mm -hmm. right? And it matters that people feel like they matter and that they feel they, yeah, that they feel to be a part of it. And so, but then you said something that's almost like the opposite, which is like, you can feel it, but it doesn't really matter. And so it has to be both, right? I mean, mm -hmm. it has to be, right? And, you know, eyes wide open that you feel, that you feel like people are listening to you. You feel like the things that matter are resonating with the world that you're connecting with. And I feel like that's why so many of our students don't vote because they just mm -hmm. not feel in it. And you can mm -hmm. say all you want that blah, 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 you know, that, that, um, that you have to vote and it's your civic duty. And if people don't feel like you're actually connecting with them, they're not going to vote. They're just mm -hmm. not. And so I just think it has to be both, right? It has to be the, that, that you feel like you matter, but also that you actually do matter. Mm -hmm. The yeah. other thing I wanted to say about government in that way in the election coming up too is that, um, is that you know it's not just the federal election right i mean that, that elections happen at all levels and um and and i think that there is a way in local politics you can feel like 
you're making a difference in a different way mm -hmm. that, that actually is, is more emotionally satisfying. Yeah. 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 I think that's a really good point because yes, I mean, obviously we, our, our values are hopefully aligning towards getting fascism out in November, but then on a more personal or like more immediate level, we can feel like our decisions matter in our local, local politics. You know, even if we don't have the affective, you know, domain turned on for Joe Biden. <laughs> <right>? <laughs> we just don't, right? Does anybody yeah. just know? I doubt it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so kind of on the, on the vein of feeling, um, I do have one other question before we move to audience questions. Um, Cause I think I, I, I'm a feeling person. I'll just put it out there. Like, you know, um, and the last line of your book really resonated with me. Um, you know, the, the final chapter is titled acting well in a traumatized world. Right. And I do, I agree that, you know, in a lot of ways we are living in a traumatized world, but the last sentence, you know, calls us to do something very, um, very powerful to me. It says we need to live in joy and create joy. So I'm wondering if you can explain how the concept of joy can be connected to accountability, democracy, and social change in general. You know, how do we experience joy as we hold power to account? Yeah, you know, I think I've been an activist for 40 years, and I just feel like I've been able to do that and stay in the game because I find joy in it. And I find so many people do activism in this kind of a miserable way, right? Mm -hmm. The world sucks. Let's stop the things that suck by engaging in terrible, miserable, unpleasant things. And it's just like, uh, and there's this idea of prefigurative politics, which is like, we're trying to build the road while walking. Like we're trying to create this joyful, caring world, sustainable, caring world as we fight the dragons that are in the way of us getting there. And I just think it's really important, right? That sort of in our relationships with each other that we find them joyful, right? That we're, mm -hmm. that, that we're actually creating that good world through the work that we do. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that, that on two levels, both like, um, it's actually more practical, right? Like people are gonna stay in the work if they find it joyful, if they find good relationships, if they have a sense of meaning, if they have a sense that, um, you know, hey, I'm a good person doing good stuff and that makes me feel like my purpose in life is satisfied in a good way. Um, and, and then all, so that's one side of it, that's sort of just like the practical thing of keeping people in the game. And then the other side I think is about really like, are we building a miserable world or are we building a joyful world? I wanna build a joyful mm -hmm. world. Mm -hmm. I love that. that. That's the bumper sticker right there. That, that yeah. was, <laughs> way better than whatever. This is what we got. <laughs> I want to build a joyful world. Oh, thank you. Yeah. yeah um, thank you for asking. That was a great question. Oh, I, I, I just, I really, I think, as you mentioned, yeah, it's a lot of it is exhausting. There's a lot of burnout, but I think we lose sight of the fact that it can bring us joy, right? And the joy is hopefully what's going to sustain us. Yeah. So, yeah. Good. Thank um, you. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Um, so I think uh, we are going to turn it over to some questions from the audience now. Yeah, so we have we have a few questions. I'll start with uh, this one. You mentioned a collective, quote unquote, loss of faith in democracy. I'm wondering if, ironically, the current threats to American democratic norms are reinforcing a newfound belief in the principles of American democracy. And if so, how does the potentiality play out in terms of social movements and holding power accountable? Well, there were a few too many parts of that question, but let me start with the, yeah, I, I have to say, so, okay, so ever since I got, you know, active when I was 20 and I'm 60 now, um, I have been a leftist and the idea of advocating for the rule of law never seemed like something that made that much sense to me, right? Because, you know, laws are generally oppressive and things like that. But now that we're facing fascism, boy, rule of law looks like a really good idea. And so <laughs> I kind of think that there's a way that, that it's true that it's, as it's almost like an immune response, like we're having an immune response with this brush with fascism, which will hopefully only be a brush and hopefully we'll pull back from the brink. Um, and and so I think it's true that in this country now, there is a lot more belief in representative democracy than there was. And I think that's good, except that, but then I also want to say this thing that the, the main point that I'm making in the book is that these unruly forms of power, like markets, like transnational institutions, like systems of meeting that dehumanize people, those kinds of, 
we do need more than just representative democracy to hold those systems of power to account. So while also wanting to say like, yay, go representative democracy, let's do that well. I also want to say, let's, let's broaden our view of democracy. Okay. And then I have another question. What does respecting someone's humanity look like in practice when it is not formulaic? Uh, how about like not shooting them, you know? <laughs> Right. So, I, I mean, I just think about what's going on with the police right now. It's just like, um, you know, George Floyd's humanity was so not respected by any of those four officers who murdered him in cold blood. Right. And so that to me. And so it's basically, you know, so I, I want to go. I think that was Vanessa Wang who asked that question. I'm not sure whoever asked that question. I, I'm like, I wonder what you're getting at with the formulae, because to me, it seems pretty basic. Right. It's like that a person is fully deserving of all the human rights in the UN Declaration of Human Rights. Like they're just fully deserving of all that. I think, I think that might be enough for me. Okay. But uh, wait, my friend Vanessa is a philosopher and she's like, she asked that question and she's giving like a little of, so Vanessa, do you want, do you want can you unmute Vanessa and have her, her, unmute her? Yeah, yeah. Let me, let me with me on that one. I don't know where she's going to go. Okay. Hold on. Here we go. You see, that's why this is better than a webinar. This is much yeah. more. <laughs> okay, Vanessa, you should, you have the floor, I think. Oh, thank you. Um, no, I, you know, I, I'm thinking about how a lot of people are doing a lot of anti-racist work right now. They're doing a lot of, you know, DEI work. Um, and there are a lot of people who are handing people formulas mm -hmm. um, about how to behave or how to be an anti-racist. Here are the rules. How do you not practice white supremacist culture? Here are the rules. Um, so I'm kind of looking for something beyond cookie cutter and something like, how do we think about culture? How do we think about cultural differences? How do we open up ethical spaces of mutual respect? when we have cultural differences and we read these things differently. So it's, it's not always completely straightforward. <laughs> I guess, but I think, but I think you, what you said though about, about mutual respect, it's like if you and I have a difference, right? And maybe we have some different cultural norms, like you like things loud and I like things quiet or something like that. Like, you know, Vanessa worked on the cultural plan for the city of Oakland, right? Where people are arguing about whether or not you can barbecue in public and things like that. So, you know, when you get to those kinds of issues, I guess I, I think, I really believe that when you start from a position of mutual respect, you can generally work things out, you know, right? And, then, and that there aren't formulas and that it, 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 it's especially not about formulas. It's especially about you know what I mean? Just like moving forward from that place of respect, we negotiate. And when we care about each other, we, you know, like, you know, people who have different like levels of cleanliness within their house, you work it out. Thank you. Thanks, Vanessa. I have, um, another question. Uh, you mentioned Gramsci as an influence. Uh, could you talk more about some of your other influences? And if you were to offer a reading list, oh, what dear. would that be? Okay, I wonder who that was. Uh, so yeah, uh, Gramsci is my, he's, he's like sort of my top guy in some of that kind of, in those things. Um, you know, I've learned a lot from Marx. And what I would say is that Marx is brilliant in his critique of capitalism and has almost nothing to say about politics, but he's great in his critique of capitalism. Who else is on my top reading list? So that is a really, really hard question. Um, I think uh, Martin Luther King's book, um, Chaos or Community, Where Do We Go From Here? The theory of power in that book is really, really strong. It's really strong. Um, Patricia Williams is great on um, rights and how, how rights get distorted by how we think about by, by racism. That, that's a couple, let's just leave it there. Cool, cool. Are there any more questions? We still have time. You can raise your hands too if, uh, if you don't. How wanna... do we deal with the power conspiracy theories that are now so amplified by the internet? Oh, that's great. That is a good. Chessa, can you answer that one? Because I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> um, Mute. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Mute you. Well, no, 
I think it, I mean, you know, we talked about education, right? And I think now is a time when we just really need information literacy curriculum uh, because we, are, I'm, there's so much content out there that students, uh, for me, at least in my classes, really need to learn curation as opposed to like, you know, just how, I mean, writing a sentence is very important, but really curating the stuff that you read is important. I feel like it's higher level thinking, but I don't know if yeah. you have more to say. And don't you think, right, so that's what we have to teach our students is how, to, and, and just, yeah, how to curate your newsfeed. But, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, my feeling about the sort of, you know, QAnon and all the people who are just going off the rails, Another one of my favorite authors is Bruno Latour, and he has a book called Down to Earth that I really like. And one of the things he talks about in that book is that, that we are in an epistemological crisis. In other words, we're in a crisis of, of knowledge, like what's true and how do you decide what's true? That that's a huge social problem right now and getting worse and worse kind of as, as the sort of because, um, you know, it used to be that there were gatekeepers on knowledge, right? And, and now there aren't those gatekeepers. And so it's a free for all and people find it really hard to know who and what to believe. So that's just a super serious problem. And then when you've got sort of people in positions of authority who are totally untrustworthy, and I'm gonna go back to the mainstream Democrats, you know, it's like you can, you know, I mean, the Republicans are obviously just making completely just crazy, you know, crazy, crazy stuff up. But, but the mainstream Democrats, you know, Hillary Clinton and those folks have had a view of the world which is deeply problematic and the sort of like dominant hegemonic mainstream New York Times reading view of the world is full of lies. It's full of lies. And so then people don't believe that, then what are they going to believe? So I do think that those are practices of how um, so they should listen to us, right? So, you know, I, <laughs> I, and so I, 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 I lights. <laughs> And, but I think it's hard. I mean, I think we are an epistemological crisis because the authorities have not been trustworthy. And the way we get ourselves out of that is by creating ways of living in the world that are trustworthy, right? And, and hopefully we're going to get there. Okay, we have a few more questions. I think we have a little time here. Um, let's see. You seem amazingly optimistic. How have you been able to retain that optimism after 40 years of toil during which the country, if not the world, has been going in the opposite direction? Oh dear, I wonder who asked that. Oh, so my friends all know that that's just character and logical in me. I have no idea. I have no idea how I stay optimistic. Um, but you know what I would say is that it, it, it's, uh, Gramsci, my favorite philosopher, um, has an expression that I really like, which is that you should have pessimism of the intellect and optimism of the will. And so that, that idea is that you don't candy coat reality and pretend that it's fine when it's not. You allow, action, you allow yourself to see the, and this is a sort of a principle in Taoism too, allow yourself to actually see the world around you for what it is, right? And to try as hard as you can to really see it. And then you look for the places where there's possibility. So I don't spend time thinking about things I can't do anything about. I mean, and then again, and, and that's one of the things they teach you in mindfulness meditation, but that's Something I just, I don't, I don't know why I'm like that, but I am like that. And I think it's helpful for an activist to, to put my attention in the places where I can make a difference. And that's where I live my whole entire life. And it keeps me happy. Sorry. Okay. Um, let's see. I just saw the comment about taking a shot every time you mentioned Gramsci. That's why I, I know I saw that. <laughs> I'm just like, okay, I promise I won't mention my favorite Italian Marxist philosopher again. <laughs> Thinking about the election, how can we have unity when we need it without letting go of what matters to us most? We have to be flexible, and that's just true being an activist no matter what our circumstances are, right? And so, and so you know, I feel like um, coming up to this election, I'm putting quite a bit of time into local stuff. And I know who people who are putting a lot of time into, you know, calls and postcards in, you know, red zones. And, um, you know, and, and we, and so you just have to have, it's, it's sort of like Du Bois' double consciousness. You know, you have to, you have to do what you can to make sure that the fascists don't win in November. And then you have to keep fighting for all the, the proper social movements. And so, you know, pretty basic, right? And so it doesn't cost very much to vote, doesn't cost very much to get involved in, you know, making sure that the election at the federal level goes the right way. Um, 
And then the day the election's over, you carry on pushing as hard as you can to make good things happen. You know, so that's just that's just basic activism 101 is that you just got to keep keep grounded in what what really matters to you and what the deep problems are you're trying to solve. Oh, somebody, uh, Naomi says, we want to invent a drinking game where you drink oh. every time Cynthia says Gramsci. Yeah, yeah, Chess already shared that. Naomi, you can drink as much as you like, okay? <laughs> so um, another question, how do we approach shifting uh, the world views of people so that we recognize our relationship with world outside our skin, two-legged, four-legged, winged, flora, et cetera, and hold a worldview where life matters? Oh yeah, I think that was probably Jen, Jen and Joni. Anyway, um, um, she's always I like the word winged. Um, you know, I, I think it's by constantly reminding ourselves of the depth of those interactions and interdependencies. You know, mm -hmm. I, I I think the extent to which to which we understand that the, that we know that you know we need trees to have oxygen and we mm -hmm. you know. Um, that we have a better life when all those other creatures are there. I just think knowing the truths about that, right? Just knowing the truths about kind of biodiversity and all of that kind of help us see that. I don't know. I, I myself am not a, um, you know, I, I do quite a bit of sort of outdoors stuff, but I don't, I don't know. I, there are other people I think who have more, more stuff to, to say about kind of how to, um, uh, how, how we get to that place. I mean, I, I can tell you, um, one of the things we do in my office with our interns is we all go on hikes together. And, and I've gone on hikes with kids from San Jose who've never been outside the city and up into the hills, you know? And so that thing about sort of who is nature for and who does it belong to, there's a lot of people doing good work on trying to get rid of the sort of racism of, of like who's allowed out in nature and who's not. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah. Well, we are coming to a close here, uh, would either of you like to make any closing comments? Chessa? Uh, I just really appreciated this conversation, Cynthia. I mean, I always love talking to you, so thanks for asking me. <laughs> and thanks to everybody for uh, bearing with my questions. Yeah. yeah, no, thank you so much, Chessa. It was fun, and it really did feel like a dialogue and not a lecture, which is a heck of a lot more fun for me and probably also for people listening. So that was great. So yeah, thanks, everybody. Well, thank you, Cynthia. Thank you, Francesca. And thank you all in the audience. Please, please do purchase copies of this evening's title. Uh, the link is in the chat function. Uh, as I said before, every little bit helps in keeping City Lights afloat. Uh, we're going to be rebroadcasting uh, tonight's event on YouTube. We'll be posting the address on our social media pages. So keep an eye out for that. And of course, as always, to learn more about our upcoming events, visit us at citylights.com. In August, we've got all kinds of more events coming up in the fall. Um, just a lot of stuff. Patty Smith, Carrie Arsenal, Hari Kunzru, much, much more. So look forward to seeing you all in the near future. Have an excellent evening and be safe. Be well. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.